If the students K through 12 not to be intimidated, not to be afraid of math, science, physics, and basically using astronomy as a teaching tool to get them into that stuff, to ask a lot of questions and to show them some incredible stuff up there. So tonight we'll listen to John's talk and slideshow, and after that, hopefully the sky stays clear. Yes, we have both telescopes to. going, both sides of the building, we have telescopes going and volunteers to staff them. So afterwards, after we do some questions and answers, feel free to go back up to the telescopes and we look at whatever we can find. There's some good stuff, there is a half moon, which washes out some of the darker uh, objects, but we just have to take that. The moon itself is pretty nice to see all the craters. So with that, now we're missing. been a volunteer we're now for five years, mm -hmm. six years, yeah. somewhere there. I think for five, yeah. Five, he's from uh, Longmont, mm -hmm. so he's pretty close. And he is a very interesting guy. He reviews all the educational materials that NASA puts out for K through 12 education, or is it college? It's everything, yeah. Education. We've we've had, uh, all the way up to graduate school, museums, informal audiences, cool. everything. Yep. So does it ever go <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Could someday. Some of that stuff is way far out. Yeah. But anyway, so he is very involved in educational materials, <coughs> educational stuff. So this is part of his outreach program as well to do a talk about this kind of stuff. And it's very interesting research that he has done. So I hope you all enjoy that. And afterwards, let's go observe some real stuff in space. Thank you. Okay. Hi, well, welcome everyone. Um, actually, going to just spend the next 45 minutes summarizing Star Wars. So, <laughs> no, I will not. <laughs> no spoilers here. So. I have not seen it. I don't. It's it's a week you from now. I, I've got a lightsaber at home. Yes. So, you guys didn't get tickets there, so you're here. I I, I see how it is. Um, so yeah, you, you think at uh, Christmas time, uh, top of a tree, you get a star. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, what this star could be. Did it uh, lead these three wise guys to a desert, shine over a little desert city, or sit on a business card? I don't really know what business you would be in to have this is the background of your business card. It could be a rocket. <laughs> so, the nature of the star, the star of Bethlehem, uh, is interesting to religion, history, science, philosophy. We're going to use a little bit of uh, all these disciplines tonight and try to see what it could have been. Of course, it could have just plain out been the glory of God that led the uh, wise men and got them to the right place at the right time, and that would be the end of the talk. So. That's too short. You came all the way out here for, for cold, so uh, it's, we, can, we can go a little further than that. So, and I will go into the gospel and the stars a little bit later. Talk about the um, actual role and link in Judaism to astrology. Believe it or not, you're going to hear the astrology word. Right? Why was it, why would that be? So we'll get to that in a little bit. But to, to figure out what this star might have been, we need to figure out when Jesus was born. So. First thing that might come to mind is zero, right? That's AD and BC and but we actually didn't even have a zero. There's no zero year it goes from uh, 1 BC to 1 AD. Kind of a little tricky there. Um, and biblical scholars and historians say it's probably Jesus was born in the BC years. Uh, it was a time when Roman Empire was at full strength and we had um, uh, Gaius Octavia, Octavian is the emperor of Rome, and Herod was ruling over Judea, and he was a pretty nasty dude. So we know his rule probably went from 27 down to somewhere in there. We don't know exactly when uh, Herod uh, came uh, King of Judea, probably around 38 BC, but Josephus is a, a Roman historian who gives us a nice 
outside view of this time period, um, says that Herod died at the time of Passover and just before the eclipse of a moon. So we had a, a blood moon. So all the lunar eclipses are kind of blood colored. So I know people got very excited with the four uh, lunar eclipses we had over the last year and a half, and they were really cool to see. But uh, the world didn't end. We're still here. So. <laughs> So calculations show, and you can do this even on apps on your phone now, uh, you can go get an astronomy app and run the clock back and see that there was an eclipse March 13th of the year 4 BC. So Jesus had to be around before then. Um, Herod died in late winter 4 BC, it had to be somewhere earlier than then. So now we have Herod kicking it right there at 4. All right, so going further, uh, we have another historical clue, and that is that Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem because they need to be counted and taxed, Roman decree. And we have records of when these taxations and censuses were carried out, and we have 27 BC, 7 BC, and 14 AD. And again, we didn't have telephone and email back then, so it took a while for word to spread around that, hey, everybody's supposed to go to where they were born and, and uh, get counted. <clears throat> so the one in 27 BC is too early, and the one obviously in 14 AD is too late, so the taxation at 7 BC is probably the one that we're going to need to focus in on. Alright, we know that Jesus was taken into Egypt by his parents. Um, when Herod decreed that all the male infants under the age of two be put to death. That's a pretty nasty guy. I told you he was bad. And <clears throat> so, it probably took a couple years to get out to Egypt, and then when Herod was uh, uh, gone, be able to come back. So, that kind of gives us an overlapping time from 7 BC down to 5 BC. Remember, the counts backwards as we go towards uh, one. We can go further, taking a look into Luke, we see that Jesus was about 30 years of age at the start of his ministry. Also in Luke, his ministry started in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius. In John, we see um, when he's uh, talking with the Pharisees, they complain that 46 years was this temple in building and you want to raise it, tear it down in three days. And that occurred around 27 uh, to 29 AD. So 28 AD was about Jesus' 32nd birthday. So going backwards, that helps us get kind of narrowed down to the 6 to 5 BC era area. All right, can we go further, maybe to the time of year? Well, the Bible says that Jesus was born while shepherds are in the fields. They're watching over their flocks at night, so animals wouldn't come in and, and, and uh, get them. Um, and that wouldn't happen at Christmas. It's cold, just like it is here. In fact, we're pretty similar latitude. They're about 32, 33 degrees latitude in, in uh, uh, around Jerusalem. So uh, springtime would be the time that you would expect the uh, shepherds to be out doing their, their work here. So by process of elimination, we're down to about springtime of 6 BC. Now, why do we have Christmas in December then? Well, this goes to changes in the sky. The path of the sun is tilted on a line um, in the sky, and the constellations that the sun seems to travel through is called the zodiac. So if you plot the sun, once a month throughout the year, it does this big loopy thing. That's because the earth is tilted, 23 and a half degrees. Here in June, first day of summer, <clears throat> the sun is high, the days are long, the sun is shining down on uh, the ground more directly, warming everything up. It feels really good. That sounds really good right now. All uh, right, here we're at the other extreme. December 21st, this year is the beginning of winter. The sun is low, it doesn't stay up very high, uh, high in the sky, it doesn't stay up for very long either. The sunlight that hits is coming in at an angle, so it doesn't warm up the ground very much. So we have winter beginning. 
<coughs> ancient people, not knowing exactly what was going on, could have become concerned that the sun was just going to keep on going down and vanish. That, and that would be a pretty bad thing to happen. Um, the Romans were sophisticated. They knew that the sun was not going to uh, go away. But around the 25th of December, if you're um, an astronomer type, astrologer basically, looking at the sky th at this time, that's about the point that you can see the sun is starting to definitely come back up. That it were, it's not going to stay low forever, it's not going to keep on sinking, the sun's going to move back up. So it was uh, an opportunity for a good party called the Saturnalia. And Christians at the time were in constant danger of losing their lives at the hands of Romans. So they realized if they celebrated the birth of Christ during the Saturnalia, they could kind of make it under the radar there. So even though Jesus was really born probably in the springtime, December 25th is now our time for Christmas. So we'll look at this in a little more detail later, but if God built meaning into the heavens and prepared an event in the heavens to predict the, sun, the birth of his son, what might that have been? A star to ancient people wasn't just a little dot of light out in, in space, made of hydrogen and helium, and burning with nuclear fuel in the core. They didn't have any idea. In fact, the term star is pretty loose and can be anything that's interesting happening in the sky. It can be a collection of things in the sky. We have fixed stars, um, but we also have falling, bearded, new, and wandering stars. A wandering star is translated as planet now. So let's take a look at a few of these and see if any of these could have been the Star of Bethlehem. Well, a falling star, shooting star, are actually bits of sand, little specks of dust. Almost all of them are smaller than your pinky nail finger. Occasionally bigger things hit the atmosphere and maybe make a nice big trail across the sky, a long smoke trail. Those are called bolides or fireballs. Um, but the little ones are tiny. And they hit the atmosphere going many tens of miles a second, second, not hour, and they burn up due to friction. So go ahead and put your hands together. I got applause, all right. Okay. Rub your hands, rub, 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 Feel that warmth? Okay, you can do it. If your hands are cold, you can keep doing it. Um, that's friction, and these little rocks get so heated up that they flash into light. They burn up. Uh, a lot of dust is settling out of the atmosphere all the time. The Earth picks up uh, hundreds of tons of new space dust every few days. Most 70% of it falls in the ocean. But if you were like me and didn't clean the house all year, uh, before I got married, um, and then you went on vacuuming everything around, you'd vacuum up a few ounces of space dust. So it's a good reason not to clean your house. You're <laughs> saving up space dust. Yeah. Yeah, it's like working, it's not working. Okay. But these are very common, these are very short. Um, this, these are not good candidates for the uh, uh, Star of Bethlehem. And the Magi, we'll get to them in just a little bit, uh, needed something that was visible for a long time. They had a multi month trip from the region that is today Iran all the way over to Israel. All right, let's go to a bearded star or a comet. These hang around longer. They can stay in the sky for weeks or months at a time. These are multi-mile to a few tens of miles in size rocks with frozen water and nitrogen and oxygen and other what are called volatiles like that. And as they get close to the sun, <clears throat> you can get an ion and dust tail off of them as they get warmed up by the sun. And it, they do stay around for a while. You, you can go out and see a comet. We have Catalina in the morning right now. If you have binoculars, it's uh, not too far from Venus. And again, with a, any little app or programs on your home computer, you can uh, get a little chart and see where, where they are located. I think probably the NASA website probably has information there. Um, what's it? Uh, 
spaceweather.com often has uh, information like that. So yeah, you can go out and see a comet and, and I looked at it a week ago. I saw the comet about three weeks ago when it was really small. So you can, comets are around for a while. The most fa famous comet record in history is uh, Halley's Comet. It's in the uh, tapestry of Bayou, France. Uh, it shows the events surrounding the Norman Conquest in 1066. You got people staring up here at the comet, and they're all going, "Ooh, look, comet!" So this is this is how you took pictures on your phone back then. So you, you made big tapestries. But the problem is, for almost all peoples in ancient time, comets were scary things. They were signs of impending doom. They were wicked torches in space, and so, an, or an omen of evil even. So that's probably not something that people would look to as foretelling that the, the king of the Jews is coming. So further, we don't have a record that a comet appeared around our time that Christ was born or in the year or two beforehand, and the uh, uh, Arabian region, Persian region, Babylonians, Chinese astrologers all kept records and we have records going uh, way back further than this. I think I got that on the next slide. No, I don't. Huh, okay. The next candidate would be a fixed star or a new star and these are actually old stars. When a star puffs off its atmosphere as it gets really old it loses its outer envelope of hydrogen and helium to space what's left is a cinder called a white dwarf and if it had a, another star maybe a little younger or a little smaller than it that lived a little longer and it puffed up and started to die it can dump new hydrogen and helium down on the white dwarf that builds up to a point that it explodes and so for weeks or so you can see a, a new star appear up in the, in the sky called a nova. Even more rare and spectacular is a supernova when a large star uses up its fuel goes all the way to trying to make iron in its core and it can't. It collapses and explodes out into space making a supernova and those are bright they also last for a pretty good long time, depending on uh, how close it is to Earth. Uh, 1054 AD, we had one happen in the uh, constellation of Taurus the Bull, also called a guest star. That one outshone the full moon. You could see it in daytime uh, for more than two months because it was close to, to Earth. Here's a picture of it today from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is Mese object number one, the Crab Nebula. And you can look at pictures taken just back in the 80s or 50s and you can see that the clumps of material are still spreading out from the central explosion point. Probably a neutron star down in the core there. <coughs> the supernova of 1054 is only one of five such events in all of recorded history and none of the other four happened close to this time. Uh, we're interested in of Christ's birth. So, not a new star. Uh, so here, here we got the uh, slide I was looking for a moment ago. So their good record keeping shows the oldest recorded supernova going all the way back to 185 AD. Earliest recorded sunspot even goes back to 364 BC. You had to be careful there. And earliest surviving comet record 240 BC. So, nothing there. We have to go deeper to figure out what this star is. Well, let's not look at what, let's look at who. Let's see who saw the star. And we don't see anything in the Bible that says that Mary and Joseph saw the star. The shepherds didn't. They saw angels, but not the star. We know that King Herod didn't see it because he had to ask the wise men about it. And we, last year I did a large section where I looked at other cultures in the world to see if anybody else had a record of it. And 
and we don't see anything uh, around the world in what civilization there was at the time um, in records that have survived. The only ones we know for sure saw were the wise men. So who were they? Um, the wise men are, as they call themselves, magi, came from Persia, the Iranian region, and we get the word magic or even magician uh, with the root magi. They were soothsayers, they were astrologers of the Zoroastrian religion. And as a priest of the religion, they had to make predictions based on the things they saw in the sky. Uh, just a little footnote here with the Magi, we only think there were three of them because they brought three gifts. There are often 12 Magi in, in some Eastern Christianity branches, uh, 10 in some other groups. Um, and all of them have names and stories and none of that is in the Bible. So we don't really know how many of these, these guys were traveling along. But they spent their time studying five special objects, these wandering stars. <coughs> and we know today what a planet is, but they were things moved in the sky by the gods and that could foretell the future. So let's look at the, some of these planets here that we're going to focus on. Jupiter goes around the sun every 12 years. Saturn goes around the sun every 30 years. And they pass each other, with Jupiter going faster, of course, uh, every 20 years. So if the star of Bethlehem was not a supernatural miracle, but a miracle in creation itself, then there is an astronomical or astrological possibility here. And since the Magi were astrologers or sorcerers, then that's what they were focused on. <clears throat> and they would have been aware of prophecies like this. In Numbers, you say, I see him, uh, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter, a king, will rise out of Israel. John Gill has a commentary on this where he says, you, you could better render that as when a star steers its course unto Jacob, then a scepter bearer shall rise up unto Israel. This would indicate that the star would be an index finger pointing to the prophesied owner of the scepter. So what they would have seen is a rare triple conjunction. And we'll talk about what a conjunction is in a second. It's just something passing close to something else. Between Jupiter, the king of the planets, it was Marduk to the Babylonians or Zeus to the Greeks, and Saturn, the harvester or reaper, and, or also Kronos in time. And this is in the constellation Pisces, which to the Zoroastrians was the house of the Hebrew. <clears throat> so it would have read to these guys, the time of the harvester has come, the king of the, Hev of the Hebrews is arriving at the dawn of the age of Pisces. So here is Jupiter making a loop. Here is Saturn making a loop. And from Earth's point of view, we're making the loop happen. Uh, what, what I mean is, if you're going down the road in your parents' car, and they're in the left lane, obeying the speed limit, and big trucks are going slow in the right lane, you see that the big truck is driving along up there. It's not, you know that it's going forward. You can see it going under bridges and things. But you're slowly catching up with it. And eventually, it looks like the truck stops and goes backwards as you pass it. It's still driving at 50 miles an hour, but you passed it, the truck seemed to go backwards from your point of view. And eventually, the, you look back and the truck is moving along just like it was. It, it never changed. The, that driver had the cruise control on. And, but that's what we see with the planets. We are going faster than either Jupiter or Saturn because we go around in one year. And so we overtake and pass these planets and make them look like they go backwards in the sky. <clears throat> so this happening in Pisces, and we're going to talk about all the constellations in just a little bit, but uh, is the house of the Hebrews. So <clears throat> they knew planets looped sometimes. That wasn't a surprise. But doing a loop around each other three times was weird. So let's look at some quick astronomy terms and then we're going to take a look at this looping happen. So a constellation is just a neat picture that people make up in their heads of how the dots connect in the sky. 
in modern times, we've made everything really official with boundaries and there are 88 constellations and they own every part of the sky. But in ancient times, the star maps are a little more fanciful and, and sort of uh, pictorial like that. A conjunction is just when two or more things in the sky get really close to one another. How close doesn't really matter. If you say, wow, those look close, ha, you just saw a conjunction. <laughs> the zodiac is 12 of the 88 uh, constellations in the sky that we call official constellations. Now, every nation and people had their own constellations, but these are just the ones that lie behind the sun at some point of the year. And since the sun and the planets are like BBs going around the sun in the center on a plate, it's one big flat disk of the solar system, all the planets and the moon seem to go through these constellations as well. So this path of the sun, the moon, and the planets uh, through the stars is called the ecliptic. <coughs> Earth's equator up in space, uh, as I said before, is tilted 23 and a half degrees. So we see the sun above sometimes, sun below sometimes. Planets are above sometimes, some, 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 below the equator in the sky. One important point here, and what we're going to focus on, is this point where we had winter starting when the sun's down at the lowest point, summer starting when the sun was up at the highest point, when the sun is on the way down, that's the first day of fall, and when the sun is on the way up, that's the first day of spring. So we're going to look right in this area. This is where <clears throat> Pisces is, and we're going to, I think we have to darken the room, he'll, he'll start the video here and I'll describe, we're going to look at a whole year go by, <coughs> starting on March 22nd, 7 BC, here's the sun, right on the vernal equinox, that's the first day of spring, here's the path of the sun and moon and planets in green, here's the Earth's equator, drawn up in the sky. Here's the constellation Pisces right here as a fish tied by a string to another fish up here. There's Jupiter. There's Saturn. Sometimes Saturn's name vanishes for a moment, so keep your eye on uh, Saturn. And we also have Uranus and Mercury in here, but they wouldn't have known about Uranus and Mercury was only visible uh, when it's really close to the Sun, so it's kind of hard to see. But they're interested in Jupiter and Saturn. So here we go. Here goes Jupiter, here comes Saturn, pass number one, pass number two, pass number three, pretty close. Here comes Mars in here, passes through him, and then the Sun uh, comes in. So now we're almost a year later, March 10th, 6 BC. That's a so it would have taken a year to see this all happen. They would have been out at night charting this all, being very aware of these little dots in the sky. It wasn't obvious to everybody. And like we said earlier, we didn't see that King Herod saw it and, and like that. So here's Jupiter, here comes Saturn again. One and two and three. And then in comes Mars. All right, so how rare are these things? I mean, if this happens every few years, they pass every 20 years, I said, well, that's not a big deal. 
But a triple conjunction on average happens about every 456 years. And looking at all the occurrences around 7 BC, uh, you see before that, it was 146, 145 BC. After that, it was 452 AD. <coughs> so, and it had not happened in Pisces since the Zoroastrian religion really got its act together, which was around 450 BC, so after this one. So only 14 uh, in the last 2,800 years were even as close in passing each other conjunction as these. So it was a pretty special event. That was, that was something pretty big for uh, astrologers at the time. Now there are other theories that exist. There's a lunar eclipse with Jupiter. Yeah, Jupiter and the moon can go over planets sometimes. That happened in 6 BC. That's a little late for uh, the um, wise men to start their trip. Conjunction between Jupiter and the star Regulus, known as, as the little king to the Magi, um, <coughs> uh, happened 3 to 2 BC, which is much too late. There's a conjunction between Jupiter and Venus and 2 BC uh, and like that. So this just doesn't fit in our tight little window of when Jesus was born to lead the uh, Zoroastrian guys on over there. So also knowing that Mars was coming in at the end, they would have seen that as another conjunction coming in. So that probably really would kick in because here comes the warrior king that is going to conquer uh, to them, would have been conquering evil. We know, conquering sin. Alright, so looking at Christmas Carol, it actually might have it right. It says, Oh, morning stars together proclaim the holy birth. I see they had plural in there, and they didn't even know they got it right. Alright, so here's putting it all together, looking, zooming in on the time here. Um, we have the Roman world census, the first, uh, we have the census in Palestine, it reaches there. The first appearance of the star happens here in 7 BC. <laughs> The uh, second um, appearance, and then the third, uh, boom, 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 in 7 BC. And then Mars comes in, the Magi start traveling. <coughs> Jesus is born in the spring 6 BC. And <coughs> they get to Herod, and Herod does, tries to do a little tricky thing there to find out where Jesus is. And <coughs> um, God warns them, uh, Joseph and Mary, to take Jesus to Egypt, and off they go. Um, and maybe they return from Egypt sometime later in 4 BC after Herod dies. So <clears throat> at that time, 6 BC, there are about 200 million people on the earth in, in its entirety. Today, uh, we have more in just the US, and the world's at about 7.2 billion. And we looked at who might have known of the star, and really we found last year it was regions really close to the Middle East. It didn't extend to other places where people were. So let's go a little deeper into the zodiac and meanings um, and astrology in um, Judaism at, at this time. Um, if you're a God, would you communicate your most important message only via a book that would be finalized later in history? Um, so we'll talk about right now the gospel in the stars. That astrology today may be a twist on the good news God placed in the heavens to foretell the coming of Jesus um, or the Christ. So a hypothesis that we're going to play with here is that God placed the meanings of patterns of stars in the zodiac on men's hearts and a desire People have a desire to tell what's coming next, and that salvation is available to all mankind. So we see in Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. In Jeremiah 31, I'll put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Jeremiah 31 also, he who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night. So we see us writing on hearts and God putting the heavens in order. And Romans 2, they show the requirements of all written on their hearts. Hebrews 8, I will put them on in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. All right, so what is astrology? Well, this is the belief the position of the sun, moon, and the planets somehow tell of what is coming. <coughs> the zodiac was uh, 
in Hebrew, Maseroth. In Job uh, 38, can you lead forth the sons of the zodiac in their seasons, or can you guide the stars of the bear with their young? Job 38, uh, can you bring forth constellations in their season? It reads that way. <clears throat> We'd expect multiple people to have symbol figures in their constellations if that's how God's going to communicate it back then. So we'll look at what some theologians have done with the constellations of the modern day zodiac <coughs> going back. So the first four constellations, and we'll start with Vir Virgo, is the Virgin. That's the Virgin Mary. And through many different people in the region, it was a, a woman or a queen or a virgin, starts off the story of the gospel in the heavens. Libra, the next constellation after Virgo, is the scales. And this is the false gospel of good works versus bad works. That if you just do more good things than you do bad things, then you go to heaven. Um, that isn't how God does it. It's a gift. And that's why we exchange gifts at Christmas. It's a free gift. Uh, so right on the heels of the false gospel is the scorpion, the, the Satan or his sting of death with a little stinger on the back there. Many people have a scorpion in the, uh, in the sky throughout the, um, the region. And then right behind him is first um, man, uh, man horse archery. You got a combination uh, constellation. When you have constellations that are two like this, uh, it's a Christ picture because he's 100% God, 100% man. So here you have a uh, combination of man, horse, archer, or centaur, but he's firing an arrow into the heart of the scorpion. So he's dealing the death blow to sin down at the lowest part of the sky. This is where the sun is in winter. So you're down in the depths. You're down below the equator in the sky. The next group tells us the fruits of Christ's work, his position as mediator, and the, position, uh, the relationship between Christ and the church. So, we have Capricorn, we have the, a goat-fish combination, a new, another dual picture. we got Jesus as the sacrificial lamb and his Holy Spirit. We've got this the water connection there. Aquarius is the water bearer, um, source of living water, his Holy Spirit. Also uh, seen in some ancient writings as talking about Noah's flood being the cleansing of the world uh, back then. And then you have Pisces the fish, where we watched the two planets do their dance. <clears throat> this is the sign of the church of the age of Christ. Um, the, the bride of Christ brought, bought by his blood, that's hard to say, and the picture of the two churches in Old and New Testament covenants. Um, Pisces could also be the origin of the Ichthyus. The, the story is that they would make an ark in the sand with their uh, foot, and if the other person finished the fish with the little ark, then you knew you had a, uh, another Christian you could talk safely with and not a Roman who wanted to turn you in or something. Um, and so this is also the age that the, the vernal equinox entered this constellation, defining the age about the time Christ was born. And now, to, depending on how you define constellation boundaries, to maybe 400 years from now, we will enter the age of Aquarius. So that's where you get, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. I ain't even so afraid. I was going to do it and I did it. So, <laughs> so this is a going into the age of man where we can, we can take care of it ourselves. So. All right, then you have Aries, the ram or altar, the sacrifice once and for all, the final sacrifice, the high and elevated deliverer. So you have a ram or sheep here. And then the final four constellations tell us about the great judgment and the conclusion of God's plan. <clears throat> you have Taurus the bull. This is the resurrection. Scorpius is setting in one side of the sky as this constellation is coming up. And the front half of the bull is coming out of Aries, out of the altar. So you got the resurrection picture there. You got the Gemini the twins. So you have another Christ picture here coming as judge and ruler. And you got Cancer of the Crab is the next constellation along. 
And this is the ultimate fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. You have the star cluster called Praesipi, or the beehive cluster in here. This is the multitude or the innumerable seed uh, containing the confines of this water-born creature, so a Holy Spirit-born creature, the crab, um, and the gathering of the redeemed. And the final constellation in, in the zodiac here, the Maseroth to um, uh, Jews, was Leo the lion. So you have the lion, the king of the house, or the lion of the house of Judah, also Aslan, if you are out there watching Narnia stuff. So ending the, uh, uh, the circle. Astrology is also important in the workings of the sky, so astronomy itself, in the placement of Easter in the calendar. It's the first Sunday after the first, first full moon, after the moment the sun is on the vernal equinox. So the moment the sun is in the constellation of the age. <clears throat> this is also the lunisolar cal calendar. It's similar to how the ca Hebrew calendar worked. So Hanukkah uh, moves around based on this lunar calendar. Um, Easter can have it happen from March 22nd to April 25th and usually occurs about a week after pa Passover. Um, the Bible has a lot of these zodiac constellations like in Job and uh, the purpose of the stars in Genesis and Romans talks about not uh, worshiping these things that are up in the sky which people getting into astrology today kind of do. They look to that as their own personal future, not the future that, that God was talking about leading up to the birth of Christ. Even the 12 tribes of Israel are said to be linked to these constellations. So you got 12 tribes going around like that. Their placement around the tabernacle in the wilderness is linked to these signs as well. And when they you follow the instructions in the Bible, you actually create a cross where everybody was camped. So that's kind of cool. So is astrology good for telling your future? Not according to this. Um, heavenly bodies are something to worship. The Tower of Babel, uh, or Babel, um, come let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens. Could be a tower under the heavens, or it could reach to worship it, or dedicate it to it. So it could have been a big uh, astrological worshiping thing, and that was pretty bad news to people then. Are they essential for telling the gospel to Christians today? No, we have a Bible, so it's in translations in every language out there. So it, it served its purpose. It declared the glory of God, and uh, His eternal power, divine nature, was clearly seen. So let's go back to the star to bring it into the end here. Um, there does, if there does seem to be a connection between the meanings, people ascribe to patterns in the sky, and how God spoke to people in ancient history, then that could be how the wise men were told to find the baby, uh, baby Jesus. Uh, but how did they actually find Jesus? Um, this was a question that came up last year, so it's a little new section here. Um, so let's just look at the actual uh, verses that talk about the star and see what, what they say. Matthew 2, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, a wise man from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he uh, who has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. So from this we see that the, ri the arrival in Jerusalem happened after Jesus was born, which matches our uh, calendar from above. Viewing the star started them on their journey, and they were important enough people to be able to get to talk to King Herod. Matthew 2, when Herod... King heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and assembled all the chiefs, priests, and scribes of the people. He inquired of them where the Christ was born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of uh, Judah, sorry, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for whom you shall, from, uh, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So this thing surprised King Herod. Word had spread throughout Jerusalem that these kings had shown up. And they had to look to the Old Testament, as we call it, um, prophets in Micah 5.2 to find out where this is going to happen. That was Bethlehem. Matthew 2.7.8. Then Herod summoned the wise men, so his own uh, 
insiders and ascertain from them what time the star had appeared and sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for a child when you have found him. Bring me word that I too may come and worship him. So he was ready to go the secret plan route. He asked, had to ask advisors when the star had appeared. Were they astrologers as well? It wasn't obvious to him or the general public that uh, we're all abuzz about this now. So then we go on and say, having heard the king, they went their way and lo, the star which they had seen in the east went before them until it came and stood over where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they came into the house, wasn't a manger at the time, and saw the child with Mary his mother. They fell down and worshiped him, opened their treasures and presented him gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. So the star takes an active role in guiding them something an astronomical or astrological event wouldn't easily do. And did they even go to Bethlehem? Are they still there? In Luke 2.39, it says, when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee. So Nazareth is referred to as the city of Galilee and home of Mary. It's about 70 miles away from Bethlehem, maybe a two or three day trip. <coughs> um, Jesus would have been following all the... Um, law of the Lord, Jesus would have been circumcised on the eighth day in the temple. Mary would have performed purification, um, her, pur pur her pur I can't say it, purification on the 33rd day. And the prophecies, prophecies said Bethlehem uh, and Herod and all the male children, two and younger in Bethlehem and all that region had, were to be killed, we see in Luke. So the Magi probably went to Bethlehem, but may have traveled all the way to Nazareth to see Jesus. The shepherds knew uh, that they had been there, and many more would have known by then. So, uh, Herod said that uh, everyone in that region was to be killed. Maybe that did include things up to 70 miles away. Hard to say. We don't have any record of that. So let's go back to the star again. Is it easy to predict a triple conjunction um, from the beginning of time? Well, we have the three-body problem. Two objects going around each other. We can run computer programs forward and backward in time, but eventually errors creep in and we just can't predict any further. Um, our solar system has hundreds of objects and errors show up in just thousands of years. So is there more meaning to the stars in the morning sky that the motion of Jupiter, Saturn, Mars might have helped uh, go before and lead the uh, Magi right to the right house, we have no idea, knowing at all. It just certainly could have been a miraculous star, an angel leading the way, or God's light. Or it could have been a miracle of God putting the heavens in motion in a way that humankind can't predict, and then writing it on our hearts to recognize it. But whichever way it was, it led Magi to Jesus, who was born in a manger. Thank you very much. Thank you.